for other people listening in already. So uh, thank you, everyone. Hi, this is my name is Samadhi Niyamcha. I use he, him, his pronouns. I'm the manager of public policy at Promo and our in-house resident social worker on staff. Um, I'll be moderating our panel discussion today for our first of our Promo at Home series during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And we wanted to bring some uh, well-being and mental health resources to you. So I'm going to introduce our panelists. Uh, we have Kelly Stork, who's a licensed clinical social worker. Uh, Chad Keller, who is a psychologist. He has dialed in, so you maybe won't be able to see his video. And Riot is a volunteer at uh, SWISH, the St. Louis queer uh, helpline that we have uh, here in St. Louis run by LGBT folks for LGBT folks. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. We appreciate it. I thought I would get, so some of you, some folks submitted questions ahead of time, but we're going to get started with um, just a pretty overall general question about what are you, as professionals, kind of witnessing is the biggest impact of this crisis on mental health individuals, uh, mental health of individuals, especially um, our LGBTQ community. And why don't we have Chad start, that's okay. Okay, sure. Well, I mean, I think I think this is now week four or so. So things have kind of um, progressed a little bit that at first there was a lot of kind of just triggering of anxiety and hopelessness um, as far as what was going to be happening or what is going to be happening. Now that there's some, um, I guess, settling into this in week four, some of um, the people that I work with, kind of their anxiety and uncertainty is it's lessening a bit. Um, but what I'm starting to just hear more of is just the toll that it's taking for some people um, as far as the social kind of disconnect, not having that opportunity to be able to interact with people face to face is starting, uh, or in person, I should say, is starting to take a toll on, on people. Um, but of course, then some of my people have been actually to some degree kind of relieved that they can um, kind of disconnect from the social world that can sometimes be hostile or non affirming. And, and to have a little bit of a sanctuary within their homes. And so that's kind of what I've been seeing. Yeah, can, I'll piggyback on that, Chad. I agree. Um, I think the early wave has, so I was out for a week and I came back very anxious about how my clients were gonna be doing. There's a few things that were surprising to me. As I've talked with people, I think, um, there is a way that folks that struggle with mental health um, and then also have some experiences around trauma actually feel or have some skills and experience that have prepared them for this in ways that I think other people have been shocked and kind of um, at a loss for like how to manage through this. I've noticed that a lot of folks that have struggled with mental health and trauma have some um, familiarity with what it takes and some faith that they can use those things again here and um, be more okay. Uh, I definitely think the slowing down for many folks, and I get that it comes from a place of privilege, but for folks where their lives have slowed down, there is some learning to do. I know um, I'm having a lot of um, insights around that in my own life. So I think that's been really cool. But I think for my folks, there is a growing weariness around how uncertain it is, how long we'll be asked to be disconnected, our, our movement being restricted and our ability to, to commune with other people being restricted is, is people are getting weary. Yeah, um, all I really have to add to that is, um, I think anytime there's a crisis for for folks in marginalized communities, everything our community was already facing is just exacerbated, right? It's on steroids. So loss of income, um, you know, is, is exacerbated. I think there's some stagnancy in, in like the processing of trauma. And I think what Kelly, you were talking about, um, where a lot of people in the queer community have 
built up coping skills, right? And like quote unquote resiliency. Um, but that's not necessarily enough to buttress ourselves against a crisis and increasing isolation. Um, and then the last point really, I think, is just that isolation. We are maybe isolated from our chosen family, um, or in some instances, we are quarantined or isolated with people who are actively harming us, whether that's, um, you know, physically, mentally, or just invalidating our identity. I will say I also have um, several clients um, and NOAA folks who have had their surgeries delayed um, and then others who are or were on the precipice of being ready to begin new kind of medical treatments and are that is delayed until further notice. Most of those folks are managing that like there is this kind of lobe. I mean, it's such a universal experience that I think for most of my folks that I have contact with, there is some understanding about why that's happening. Um, but certainly that doesn't change mental health impacts to, um, you know, they now have limited access to medically necessary treatments. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. We're going to move on to another question. This came in earlier today and I think it's a good one. Um, the person asks, I'm fortunate to be able to work from home during this time. But how do I make mental health space to focus on work tasks while concerns about the pandemic and caring for my family are constantly pulling my attention away? Woo! Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so very lucky. You can see this is my office. So I feel very fortunate that I still get some of that separation. Here are the things that I feel like keep coming up as needs for my folks and i'm i have sent um samadhi a little document i just made that outlines some of this but i think there's four essential things we need to be thinking about we need to think about i'm going to be able to recall them all how are we nourishing our bodies um how are we doing with food and water how are we doing with um sleep how are we doing with do we get up um out of bed do we shower do we take our medications um then how are we moving? Are we getting outside? Are we moving our bodies in ways that it needs to be moved? Um, the third a nourish, move. For me, there's a lot of need and attention and actually a lot of space open now around centering ourselves. Uh, meditation, yoga, stretching, um, whether it's uh, could be prayer if it's not meditation for some folks. Um, and there is a fourth, Ooh, I'm going to think of it, nourish, move, be, it's a fourth one. So I've talked with a lot of folks, this idea that it, it's going to look anything like it did before. We are not working from home. We are at home trying to work during a crisis. So that's going to look really different. So we need to have a lot of grace, a lot of forgiveness, a lot of flexibility, but I hope that it's right before we move to the next thing that's calling our attention that we even maybe just take a moment to take a breath or if we get if we can really stretch it 10 minutes to do a meditation a stretch a yoga pose anything that helps you feel a little more intentional if you're getting like splayed out in a whole lot of directions i think i'm hoping that that can that can help folks and i also feel like there's an openness to that in a way that wasn't that didn't exist before in our hustle culture and that there's a lot of folks putting out some really cool free content. Yeah, I think um, intentionality is, is the key word there for me, at least. Um, and just to like validate some of that, I don't know anyone who's not struggling right now. I think some of us are handling it better than others. And some of us um, have more privilege than others. Um, but other than like the uber wealthy, I think everyone I know, at least is struggling. Um, so a lot of self-compassion, a lot of grace, um, although that's easier said than done. Um, so really what works for me or what I try to implement is just rewarding myself for effort um, more so than for achieving something. So if I set just a small intention, like I'm going to get out of bed by 9 a.m. today, and that might be really difficult, um, reward myself for the effort, even if it's 930 and I didn't really accomplish it, like don't get down on myself for not sticking to that. Um, and hopefully that just kind of builds some momentum and makes it easier the following day. 
Yeah, and I think that it's, you know, building off of that whole idea of self-compassion and yeah, that some some days or some hours or I guess even some some years it's easier than others to be self-compassionate. And I think, you know, one of the things that um uh, you know, what I've noticed and what I've been talking about with people is, is that one of the struggles with being self-compassionate during this time is, um, and I think it was mentioned earlier, is that things are on steroids. And so, like, a lot of um, people's self-criticisms are really getting amped up. So, like, pre-existing self-criticisms that have been there for quite some time. Um, and yeah, applying some kind of loving kindness to that or, or at least to try to, you know, stop the cycle of kind of like self, um, kind of self kind of, um, beating oneself up, um, I think can be a really kind of helpful exercise. And that of course, you know, sometimes it's not going to be graceful or you may go down that hole for a while. But that even if you can turn it around, you know, whether it's an hour, two hours, or three hours later, um, I think can be really helpful. Yeah, I love to um, embrace the mess. Like, it is to be expected. It's really valid, and it makes sense that people are going to feel all over the place. They're going to be on the floor. They're going to ugly cry. They're going to sit somewhere for three hours and be like, what on earth did I just do? And to be like, you know, all a part of a being alive at a, as a human at all, and certainly, a, you know, as a human alive right now. Yeah, yeah. Most, sorry, Chad, if you're gonna go. Oh no, 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 no! I just, it's like, amen, Kelly, amen. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know how this is going to land for folks, but I almost feel like there's a, a beautiful opportunity in embracing that mess. Um, again, easier said than done, but like for some of us who are maybe trans or non-binary or or questioning our gender, like there's an opportunity to be messy with how we play around with gender for isolated alone. That might look different for people who are, you know, um, with folks who invalidate those aspects of their identity. Um, and again, like it's easy for me to say and hard to practice, but I do want to try to embrace that mess and, and have some fun with it where, when and where I can. Yeah, I really, really love that riot. So I have noticed that I have some folks, and again, they, they, they have the privilege of already having access to therapy. Um, but I have some folks that I think are doing some of their best work, because let's be honest, some of the struggle that's rising up in us predates this experience for us. So I am finding, and, and this is true anytime you're doing this work, that I, um, right from the chair, can have this like, oh my gosh, like, this is amazing. There's this opportunity that's presenting itself. And then I also go, and I recognize that this really sucks and this feels really painful. But from the chair to the couch, you go, I, I really do. I trust that this, um, this openness, which may not be chosen, right, is, can be really, really valuable. And I think there is some space that if you have the ability or when you have the ability to lean in and, and even if you're doing it by yourself, provide some kind of um, tending to that, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful can be really powerful for folks. I mean, the best work we do often is, is forced and we don't get to be comfortable and growing sometimes at the same time. I'm going to continue reminding myself to live in the mess. Um, we had one question. We have an interesting uh, kind of like relationship question. So the question is, I have to be I have to be long distance from my partner right now. What are some coping skills I can use to help? Hmm. Can I be honest? I'm, no, no, I was like, I know the people who are here, so I'm probably going to have to be a little careful but um so there was a question earlier about dating that you would like that might come up and i was like oh i haven't dated in 20 years so i probably need to just pass on that um but i also i'm just going to put a real sex forward message out there like people can get real creative i hope you are having fun with masturbation and self-stem and that what all these new platforms or maybe they're probably not new to most folks Finding ways to connect again, I think crisis can be the mother of invention and if it's around romance and love and connection and sex too, all the better. Great. Go for it. 
Well, yeah, and I, yeah, I would agree with kind of like what Kelly said in that, you know, I've had people be like creative, even with like um, Zoom dates. It's also fascinating to me, like Zoom dates, they're watching the same television show or movie, but they're like in different states and such. Um, and, and that's also, you know, one of the things too that I've been hearing is people have been separated um, or quarantining, oh, gosh, you can't say that word, even if it's in the same city, is, is that, you know, it's only to be expected too that, you know, some of this disconnect or not being able to spend time together may take a strain and just cause a little bit of a flare up in conflict, but to kind of perhaps recognize that for more about the circumstances versus being indicative that there's a big problem in the relationship. So. Yeah, I'm um, in a similar boat to Kelly. Um, dating is not my expertise. Um, but when I was brainstorming around this question, I was thinking, yeah, Zoom dates and being creative with that. I'm picturing like candlelit dinners over Zoom, but I also want to validate that for some of us, um, you know, Zoom or FaceTime can be a reminder of that distance that we're experiencing. And, and sometimes that can be hard to grapple with. Um, but I've seen people be really creative, you know, with sexting. There's a lot of like relationship and um, sex therapists on Instagram who are like putting out great content. Um, something else I was thinking about is just like creating a list. Um, and this is going to be personal and different for everyone, but creating a list of like what it is that you want out of your relationship. Um, like, what are your needs and just trying to work backwards from that. And I don't have those answers, but I think like what Kelly said is people are being really creative and just like seeing it laid out on a piece of paper. This is what I'm looking for. How do I get it can be helpful for some of us. And look, what if that's what we're spending our time doing inside of our relationships where we might just be spending time together or like, which is lovely. We were enjoying ourselves, but it's changed form now. Maybe this is exactly the time where you look at the like deeper levels or the wider like, what do I miss about you? Like, or what have I been struggling with that like maybe we now have some space that we can start to explore. What's that really about when 10, 15 hours of our week might have been, let's just hang out. Now, if it feels safe and manageable, it can be a place to like deepen and explore. Or it may expose um, places in your relationship that hold strain. I think that we there is a chance to be a little more mindful and intentional for those of us that have more space and time folks that aren't you know forced to still work or or have just lost jobs and are completely panicked that they're you know they're gonna lose their place to live or where they eat and the one kind of last thing that i would add is is to again try to turn down the volume because i've heard from people kind of being critical of themselves saying that well i'm feeling like i'm starting to become kind of needy and pathetic for feeling kind of so lost without my partner or without access to my partner and, and again i just you know i think that that's you know um just not helpful um, to feel that way, or it seems like a really harsh thing that chances are you wouldn't say to a friend um, if your friend was saying that, but yet you're saying that to yourself, because I think it's only normal that during the times like this, you of course want to be close to the people that um, you're in a relationship with. Yeah. Or at least if the, if the frame is negative, if there's some kind of negative interpretation of that going like, Wait, is that really what this this tells me or shows me like is this also a response that makes sense if i actually really love my partner and i miss being mm -hmm. with him and i'm scared you go oh needy uh, okay well yeah then that makes a lot of sense and then you hopefully you have a little more room to be like oh okay that's okay yeah I appreciate all that, especially the going sex positive route, Kelly. Thanks. Um, I mean, that's like masturbate. I don't know. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so this is a really important one, I thought. Um, especially since we're all inside and isolated, we can kind of go into not so helpful coping skills. What are signs that help us identify when substance use becomes substance abuse? Okay, so clearly I work off the cuff. And as soon as I saw that question, I was like, um, well, if you're asking, then there's probably a reason to 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 lean in and consider that that's probably and like 
a hint that there's something to think about. That if, again, alcohol is a non-essential, it's not like food, we need food to survive. <clears throat> so if we, if you're even asking, it's probably time to, um, and I'm all about harm reduction. It's not a like, all right, then why don't you try sobriety now? <laughs> we examine, when do I find myself craving or, or telling myself that I need alcohol? Or what are the things I tell myself um, uh, it's manageable because of this? Or how do I rationalize that? Is that showing up different? Is that better or worse right now? I think it's just a time. I mean, I tend to think that getting curious is way better than getting critical at any point. But I, I curious. And then I also have some folks who are really, who are getting some, some great substance abuse support right now. AA groups have moved online. Um, I have some folks who are really, really benefiting from that. So again, maybe if you have more space and time, that's a, it's a time to experiment with. What if I read this thing or I explore this, right? Or I join this group or I just, I listen to a podcast that might give me, if I'm truly asking, that might give me more insights. And then you always get to decide what you're going to do with it at any given moment. And then I would just yeah. be able to be realistic about what, what they can, to, can do right now. I think a, a theme throughout all, all of this, both with substance use, um, with dating, is a lot of us are stuck with ourselves right now. I know I often look to my friends, my chosen family, to keep myself accountable, and, and now I'm really just accountable to myself, um, which makes things difficult. I know like substance use as coping, um, now is a time where I want to numb and dissociate a lot more. Um, I would say it becomes abuse when it starts to interfere with what we want out of our life, like our, our daily goals. Um, some other like things to look out for are, you know, dependence, maybe withdrawal, inability to carry out responsibilities and how it's impacting your health. Again, I'm like not an expert. Those are just kind of what came to mind for me. Um, and if it's like regular and compulsive. Or you yeah, me. Planning or, like planning your day around that or negotiating with like, how you can feel comfortable with how much you need or are using All signs. And for me, I think about it too, from kind of that added place of like, is there just a lack of flexibility? You know, like, is that the only way that you feel like you can cope? Or can you sometimes not, you know, get stoned or not drink to be able to make it through, you know, that situation. Um, and like Kelly said, I mean, this is a tough time regardless of whether it's drinking too much or over exercising or, you know, overeating to, to, you know, don't set yourself up for that. You're going to do perhaps this whole dramatic change, but yeah, to start to explore like what might be other ways of kind of managing the discomfort that you're feeling themselves so, and that unfortunately you know uh, the you know the reality for a lot of folks too is is that um when it comes to substances is that the other coping mechanisms may not you know take away or numb as well you know and that can be a hard thing to kind of sit with and to just kind of cope with too i mean the sticky part of addiction is that just really not a quicker, more effective way if you want to check out and people have their preferred methods, that shit works. And then, but then the only way it continues to work is if you continue to do it. So we know it gets really progressive. And then by the time people understand, like I need to respond, their ability to do so is really compromised. That's, I think that's the sad, scary part of yeah. So wonderful question to whoever asked it, like so good that you're being thoughtful about it. Mm -hmm. We turn to it because it works and I just want to like return to again a theme throughout this and a previous point I made um, about that self compassion and rewarding yourself for that effort. I think that's taking that harm reduction stance is like maybe Wednesday was two drinks Thursday that's you know one drink and that's progress right maybe we want to get to zero drinks. Um, but if you cut back a little bit find some way to reward yourself. Hopefully that reward is intrinsic, just a good feeling. But if it's going to the cabinet and getting, you know, a recess peanut butter cup, that works too. <laughs> Do not have any recess peanut butter cups in my cabinet and I'm suddenly craving one. Um, <laughs> I know. Like, oh, that's a good snack idea. Um, so 
This is a good question. I'm having a hard time with this too, personally. Um, how do we set boundaries around social media and the news, like we're, especially when we are in in the middle of this entire thing, but and everywhere we go, there's like posts and news, and that's all we're talking about. How do we set boundaries with that? Well, um, I was looking at some suggestions for that. I'm beginning to see even things that I've done um, for myself, um, probably about a couple, you know, and th yeah, there's this balancing act of staying informed and then just being kind of um, triggered um, or kind of reliving kind of trauma narratives in one's mind as you look at the news. So like I've taken um, the my news update app off my phone. Um, I only try to look at the news in the morning um, versus before I go to bed. Um, because um, I know that there's, if I sometimes read things, that it just stirs the pot too much. Um, and then also, too, as I've been talking to some folks about, is, is kind of assessing, you know, um, I see this headline, do I want to click? Will it actually be helpful? Um, or um, will, you know, just based off of the headline, will that be information that, yeah, maybe I don't need this type of information to be informed, you know, whether it's some of the kind of hostile protests um, or some of the idiotic um, statements that politicians and leaders are making that seem so, you know, um, dismissive towards people's um, realities right now. So that's the way that I've been kind of thinking about it. And then just really, yeah, like that whole mindful of with news, you know, looking at like we can sometimes get so obsessed with that stuff and it just keeps traumatizing ourselves over and over. So for me, I'll tell you, um, this is something I've had to do my whole life. Um, so I, I have to kind of go back to figure out like, oh, what do I, what have I done? I cannot do news. Um, well, I can't do news and stay very well. So I have long sworn off news. I think the way we deliver news, most of the news we get is done quite irresponsibly. Um, I think there are safer outlets. I think NPR feels um, safer and more balanced. Um, I also then have a few people in my life that I trust that if I need to know something urgently, like, that information will still come. Like, I'm gonna get that from somewhere. I have enough social connections that I'll be alerted if there's something I need to respond to. I tend to let my news filter in more slowly. Um, I have also, for better or for worse, you can judge me, it's okay. I have intentionally never uh, campaigning and through the almost four years we've gotten through, I've intentionally never listened to our president talk. Um, I may have stumbled into a room and I will then leave the room. So that's just a thing that I that I tell myself somehow protects me. And then I try to craft my social media so that my news feed and the people I surround myself with feels like content that like feels safer or more manageable. I mean, another conversation is the echo chamber thing, but it's not what we're talking about now. Right now that serves me well, is that um, I try to to be in places that feel safe and manageable and responsible. And I do, I have clients who say, I cannot check my stuff after dark. And I do, I think we should limit it to one or two times and probably spending no more than 30 minutes to an hour digesting this kind of stuff. I love these suggestions. Yeah. Definitely we'll be trying to implement some. Um, this is something I struggle with. Um, I think what does work for me sometimes is trying to find spaces where I'm away from my phone. Um, I know that if I go on a walk with my phone, I'm going to look at my phone. Um, I, I still want like that step counter to go up. So I feel a little bit better about my physical health, but I've started leaving my phone in my apartment. If I go outside, um, I know this is very not millennial, but I'm like really feeling a lot of burnout from like text based communication these days. So I prefer phone calls with people. And I've noticed that like, if I'm talking on the phone, I'm not looking at it. Um, so that feels a little bit better for me too. 
Um, this is going to be the motif for me of the day, but, you know, set those really small goals and reward yourself for the effort. Um, so it's like maybe cutting down 30 minutes, creating a very small, achievable, feasible boundary that you think you can maintain and then reward yourself for trying it, even if you're failing, um, because that's going to make it easier for you to do that next time. Um, yeah, I think that's all I've got for now. It also reminded me, because I love what you're saying about, I want more phone calls and I want like uh, maybe the video component ads. I've always had a struggle with what it means that we, um, most of, much of our communication is text-based. Also reminded me, what about when folks are separated from their partner? Are we going, like, what if we go super old school? People write letters to each other. Yes. Like that's a real, I mean, if we still have stamps in our house, we could be writing letters or even slowing things down and write an email. I don't care how it gets to the person, but that like, slow, deliberate chance to say what we really want to say to somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I have done a couple snail mail letters. Very, very fun. Um, it, it really feels like Christmas Day, like opening your mail and like not knowing what's <laughs> inside. You know, you don't get that like text preview. Um, the other thing I'll add, and this is a much harder process because um, it can be painful, I think, is is that reflection piece of sitting with for me, it's like somatically what comes up when I'm processing this news and social media, like taking a moment afterwards to like, what am I feeling in my body? How do I feel about this? Um, and maybe sitting with the like trauma, the burnout, the pain, um, because that helps me build off of it and maybe not go back to Twitter or Facebook or whatever it is that's bringing those feelings up. Yeah, I, I also, um, I have this place that I go, do, do, is this a thing I need to know more about? Am I already really well acquainted? Or for many folks, having a lived experience of this trauma or crisis, like, what else could I possibly need to know? And recognizing that much of it is just re-traumatizing. And actually, it, it makes us less equipped to be, um, to take care of ourselves and or to respond effectively. Yeah, I don't want to have like a scarcity mindset, but I think so many of us are burnt out right now. Um, so being in a mode where you're trying to preserve your own resources is very important. Um, I do want to encourage people to lean in and find community and, and provide mutual aid to others. I think that's really rewarding and fulfilling, but also preserve your own resources. So if for me, I get burnt out from social media, me in resource preservation mode is not engaging with that as much as possible. Again, I think this is a thing we have needed to do for ages and have not, like, our culture does and does not encourage this. And this, like, halt is a chance to consider what that's done for us and ways that that makes us sicker. And I hope we'll all be thoughtful about what we bring back when we can. I appreciate all of those responses. And I think Ryan said I'm definitely trying to implement some of those things to myself. Um, we have a question in one of the, in the chat. Um, specifically, it says, Kelly mentioned that we're trying to work while at home instead of working from home. How can we continue to fulfill our work responsibilities remotely, even though we might want to do nothing or just fall off the grid together? Guess what? Probably not going to fill your work re responsibilities remotely. Um, I think this is a place where we go back to. Um, I also think there's this importance in leaning in. What's the do nothing? What does it need you to hear? Like, what is it there to tell you? It is it. Is it a hint toward your mental health? Like, ooh, depression is growing. Or if you've never even used that language, can we start to recognize that like? most of us experience depression in our lives in one way or another or anxiety and like paying attention to this is not a like a problem i am a habit like there's something going on that's interrupting my ability to work like i used to or perform like i used to and and if we applied some tenderness to that and some pause around that we might actually source out something much deeper and much more important and maybe be able to respond effectively to that, which then is going to bring us back to the place where we might be able to function better. But I'm also real cool saying I'm not even sure we were supposed to be functioning like we were before. And now certainly I, I'm, I'm not. 
I'm not on that train of like, yeah, let's figure that out. Yeah, I'm more wondering like, hey, yeah, what about the want to do nothing and fall off the grid? Mm -hmm. Have you tried that? What happens when you do that for four hours or a whole day? Like, maybe that's exactly what you need. Can you do that without, you know, dire consequences? And if so, yeah, try leaning in over there. If you're able. Mm -hmm. I mean, people who are hustling and be like, really? Because I need that $27 so I can get some food. Then what I say sounds really asinine. So it really, it really depends. Luca, where, like, what that means for you. But it, I think we have space we don't take up. And I think that's, that's true before and it will be true after. And the way that I've even, as far as with students, um, you know, is even as far as just trying to kind of chunk things down, because, yeah, if there's things that, you know, if there's deadlines that have to be met or, or and or, um, you know, doing work or, you know, some period of time give some sense of control or some sense of accomplishment, then can you break it down into small manageable chunks? Um, and even kind of partnering with coworkers. So I've done Zoom kind of um, breaks with some of my fellow teaching colleagues, just as if we were, you know, talking or gossiping in the hallways and such and using that then kind of okay so i have two more hours and then we're going to be talking again um and just trying to approach it um kind of in that way sorry yeah, I think that when i come in and out sorry I, if you hear that beeping in the back i'm sorry it's just as aggravating to me right um, i think i interrupted you no that's that's okay um yeah i think like creating that list of priorities. What do I actually need to do right now? What feels meaningful to me? Um, and letting some of the, the superfluous stuff fall away is okay. I think something I'm personally struggling with this is a lot of the solutions we're grasping for, especially around like a schedule and routine and productivity are grounded in a world that maybe doesn't really exist right now and was kind of artificial to begin with, right? They were, to me, they seem like mental health containment strategies um, and like being productive, having a schedule that never really fully addressed the underlying pain that like a lot of queer and trans people are facing. Um, so that's not really an answer, but just uh, like, I want to validate this and, and hopefully like for some of us who are in a place where it's okay to let some things slide, we can be gentle with ourselves when we do let some of those things slide um, and kind of two big middle fingers up to anyone who's not letting us get away with something sliding right now. Um, I know I've, I've had some difficulties with school where I feel like I've been pulled away from like assignments or learning that would feel really meaningful to me because I have other assignments or learning that there isn't as much flexibility around. And that's really frustrating. Um, so I don't have a great answer, but those are kind of my thoughts right now. Right, you stop it. That was a lovely answer. The other thing I um, sometimes teach people to do, um, think about the way you're using your brain and body. And so it, it would look different if you're motivating towards something or if you are taking a break. But I find myself either doing or prescribing the ways that we make sound or we move our bodies so that can generate energy when we need it. Or again, I read this like, want to do nothing. Is there a need to be quiet? And are we affording that? But also if you're like, look, I can't do that right now. How do we generate energy? That's not like, how do I get really excited about those seven spreadsheets that I have to go do? Nobody, that doesn't, ex I don't think that happens. But can I jump up and down? Can I do five jumping jacks? Can I you know, clap my hands and go, whoo, okay. Can I talk out loud to myself? Can I get a cold drink? Is there any other way that I can provide stimulation or sensation? It will even get me into the next thing I have to do. And then does that sustain? Do I get caught in something? And again, Riot, I love what you're doing. You're like, did I get 20 minutes? I'm a rock star. Way to go. Okay. Now I'm going to go outside, look at this, you know, sun on the ground, come back and try again. I kind of want to plug Squish a little bit there. Um, so for folks who, who feel like maybe calling the St. Louis Career Support Helpline, 
um, and receive it. You know, I, I'm trying to do a lot of that cheerleading for, for myself right now, but if you want cheerleading from someone external to you, that's a great resource. And some of these suggestions, um, especially what you were talking about, Kelly, with the, those, like, those like activation strategies, to me, I would almost frame that as like safety planning your work responsibilities. And sometimes we need some help coming up with those. Like, I think people are resourceful and know what works for them, but sometimes it's, it's good to have someone else to bounce ideas off of. What might work for me to activate, get some energy in my system, get some motivation to just get through those spreadsheets? And WISH can do that. It doesn't have to be, I'm in a mental health crisis. It's like, or an active mental health crisis. It's like, can, can I steal three minutes? Can you give me three minutes of like, I've had folks who get so overwhelmed that they're like, they forget that they can like pull over the car and then they call someone and they're like, oh, right, of course, that's the next thing to do. It's just that our brains get flooded. I love that, that squish can be like, can you unstick me? Like, yeah. this could take me two minutes. It could take me 12 minutes, it doesn't matter. That's beautiful. We are coming up on time, so I want to give each of our panelists uh, a quick, well, obviously a thank you. I really appreciate you being here for our first Promo at Home series. This is awesome. And um, any last minute suggestions or tips for kind of managing our well-being right now? Quick, like 30 seconds, anything that we've missed or haven't covered so far? <laughs> 30 seconds. <laughs> um, I feel like I'm on stage and I'm doing something. Uh, I would just say, in terms of, you know, don't doubt yourself. That's what I always think. Like, there's so much strength. Um, and I think Riot said it earlier, you know, two steps forward, one step back. And um, that's just kind of. I guess what I kind of get a focus on and that kind of let go of the need to be perfect and that it's not going to be a graceful process during this. So I think continuing to practice and an intend, which is not forceful, just set an intention. Like, do I look like I am in a relationship with someone I love with myself? Does my relationship remind me of a relationship where I have like an unconditional or uncomplicated offering of love. If that's a, if that's modeled through a relationship you have with a child or a partner or a best friend, really checking that like, would I say or feel these things about someone I love? And if it's happening for me, then like, have I lost a loving connection with myself and just coming back and finding a way, which will provide you so much energy, again, when it's accessible to just be in a relationship that's led by love with yourself. For me, I think um, self-care is a bit of a loaded term sometimes. Um, it helps me to break it down categorically. So I'm operating from this definition that self-care is meeting our emotional, spiritual, community, personal needs. So what is one thing we can do each day to meet maybe just one of those needs, or you can break it down into categories. So Practical self-care might be meal prep. Physical is stretching, or maybe it's laying on the floor, or some exercise, or a walk. Um, so create like a list of three or four things in each of those categories. I think practical, physical, spiritual, emotional, social. Um, and if you want to take it a step further, I think of like a good bad bifurcation there. So there's bad self-care. Like for me, I hate doing meal prep, but I know that if I do meal prep, I have some more energy later in the day, right? Like writing my cover letter doesn't feel like self-care because I don't want to do it. But if I do it, I can engage in some of that more like leisure based self-care that kind of feels good in the moment to me. Um, so doing one bad self-care and one good self-care or you know, breaking it down by category helps. That's kind of what I was trying to get at when with the, I don't know how folks are going to get that form, but it, it talks about checking in with yourself, how you're feeling, doing looking at those four essential parts um, what are your hopes? What are your fears? What do I need? Like, how am I coping? Am I using drugs and alcohol? Am I journaling? Like, and really just gives people a, a moment to check in with themselves. So somebody, I'm just going to trust you. I'm going to send that over and you can put it in the comments of this event and or send it out to folks if it's a little bit helpful. Thank you all so much. Is there any, um, 
If you, I know Ryan and I talked about Squish and we'll post that, but we, I think we, we will share their the helpline information as well. Um, either Chad or Kelly want to also plug their in, info if they're taking new clients or anything like that, or any resources you recommend for folks as well? Um, at the bottom of the form, I was just talking about our three or four resources. There's a couple of meditation and sleep aid apps that I really love. It's okay. Summer and Calm. Uh, beautiful, beautiful stuff. Lots of free content. And then um, a couple of COVID-19 specific resources. Um, yes, I am mostly, I'm still open to, to having conversations about people's therapeutic need, whether that's me or somewhere else. So um, I'm always just a, a phone call or an email away. Yeah, and the one um, kind of last thing that I would just say is also don't overlook like great speakers that are on YouTube, whether it's Brene Brown, Tara Brock, whether it's even a lot of the short like five to 10, 15 minute um, TED Talks that are out there. Um, you know, if you can't afford therapy, if you can't access therapy, um, or you're not quite feeling ready for that. But I think those videos can be so helpful sometimes, especially in the middle of the night, um, if you're feeling kind of um, a vortex of panic, so. I'm trying to put those things up. I have a business Facebook page, so I'm trying to put stuff that I feel like is pertinent. A lot of my stuff um, focuses on like trans and non-binary folks. I'm also doing a lot of like anxiety and I have some really, I just did a meditation before I came on and it was really delightful. So you can always go peek there and I'll, anything that I think is potentially valuable, I'm trying to pop on there. This was really fun. Thanks somebody or whoever made this up. This <laughs> well, thank you for, thank you for joining us for this. We really appreciate it. And we'll, um, I think we'll stay on to a little bit to debrief, but I, but um, folks tuning in, we'll definitely be hosting more resource discussions like this uh, going forward. So please keep following us on social media. We'll also post um, the resources that Kelly mentioned, as well as squish information uh, later today. Thank you, everyone. Just look how sweet everyone.